For those of you that don't know me, I've spent the last 29 years in a classroom, so Bud told me not to be nervous, to just think of you as my students. So if you hear these words, follow procedures, you'll know that that means you're supposed to be doing the right thing right now. And if you hear, eyes on me, that means somebody out there is not looking at me. <laughs> and that's about the way I feel as well, that you're all looking at me. Uh, very nervous. Uh, took a, a lot of bravery for me to do this, and it reminded me of, of what I saw this week. As you can see, my mustache is coming back. Last week I came with it completely shaved. I spent three days on Catalina Island at the Catalina Institute for Marine. At Catalina Island Marine Institute, I took a group of sixth graders there. They knew when they went that they were going to be snorkeling. Some of them didn't know how to swim. Now, it's a little better because they put you in wetsuits. The pants come up to here, vest, jacket, hood, booties. So once you actually get in the water, you pretty much can float. But still, picture yourself on an island for the first time ever, going into the ocean, and not knowing how to swim. And these kids did that. So after they did that for two days, and I lugged some of them around on a, on a boogie board and being a, a boat taxi driver, they said, we have an idea. We have some extra time. Let's go to the floating barge that's out just about 10 feet past where we saw the sharks swimming, and about 20 feet of water, and let's jump in, and we'll take our time at a time getting back onto the floating barge. And some of those girls that had never been in a swimming pool before stood on the edge waiting to jump in, convincing themselves that they could do it. And finally, I just told one of them, if you're going to do it, once you start moving, don't stop. And she did it. Jumped in to the ocean in over 20 feet of water, knowing there were sharks below her. She had that much trust and faith in the people that she was with. So that's me. I feel like I'm about ready to jump off. And I'm trusting you, and I have faith with you. And another thing I love about those little kids, when I came back to school and I had no mustache, a little fourth grader, and if you know fourth graders, they say whatever comes to their mind, said, what happened to your mustache? And so I couldn't resist. I told him, you know, I woke up this morning, and it was gone. All these years, I thought it was a mustache, and it was a caterpillar. It had crawled on Mrs. Oler's face. And she went right up the hallway from me, so of course, you know where that boy wanted to go. But that's, that's what I've been doing this week, other than preparing for our sermon. On a serious note, my passage today is, is Romans 3, 21 through chapter 4, verse 8. And my title, so those of you that are, are looking for my lesson objective, is Righteousness Through Faith, or the teachers know what I'm talking about. What does a passage on righteousness of faith teach us about the God that we worship? So while I'm reading this passage for the first time this morning, I would like to focus on these questions. Number one, how is man made righteous in God's sight? And number two, why did God present Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement? So if you'd like to read along, the words are up there. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice, because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time, 
so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? Is it excluded? On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham was justified. In fact, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. In order to provide a little background, I'd like to summarize the first three chapters of Romans by saying that Paul made a case that all men have failed to live up to the requirements of the law. Even though the Jews had the written law and the Gentiles had the law, that they should have been able to observe from nature, all men failed to live up to that law. He concluded in verse 9 of chapter 3 by saying, Jews and Gentile alike are all under sin. And again in verse 20, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we have become conscious of sin. The law brings us to the point in life where we know we need God's help to obtain righteousness. We must learn that we cannot earn righteousness by keeping the law. We must admit our need before we can seek a solution. Paul explains this line of thinking in chapters 7 and 8 of Romans, saying that he would not have known what sin was except through the law. And that because of the law, he came to a correct understanding of the sinful nature that existed in him before his faith in Jesus Christ. The faith that set him free from condemnation. While discussing humanism with one of my college, or in one of my college classes, my instructor asked the class, Why do so many Christians have problems with humanism? Many of the goals of humanism are shared with Christianity. When I responded to my particular problem with humanism is that a humanist person believes that man can achieve fulfillment and self-actualization on his own. And that a Christian believes that we need God, we need God's help to become fulfilled and to have a relationship with God. And that is the difference. And what she replied has puzzled me, and I never had the courage to ask her, and I wish I had. She said, Randy, that's why I like having you in my class. You keep me on track. And to this day, I don't know whether she really felt that way or whether she was just saying that because she wanted to provoke discussion. She was pretty sneaky and wouldn't tell us anyways. So. I've thought about that a lot of times when I think about the law and what the purpose of the law was. It, it, in, in my opinion, Paul's point is that God gave us the law not to catch us messing up and punish us for giving in to our sinful natures, but rather to bring us to the point where we understand 
that we can never be righteous on our own and that we need God's righteousness in, or, in order to have a relationship with him. So now for our text. Um, going back to Romans 3, verses 21 through 24. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Paul mentions twice that the righteousness that we receive comes from God. Some versions say righteousness of God, belonging to God. And he also says twice that it comes through Jesus Christ. So those are the two important things that we need to know from that section. So whose righteousness is it that we receive? It's God's righteousness. Shouldn't that be enough for us? If we have God's righteousness, shouldn't that be enough that we don't have to seek after our own righteousness? And I know that Peter standing at the pearly gates, deciding who comes in and who doesn't is not biblical, but just go along with me for a minute as I tell the story. Peter's at the pearly gates. He's got the remote control in their hand because everything has remote control now. So pushes the button, the gates open. There's a long line of Christians waiting nervously to get in. Peter calls the first one up and asks, whose righteousness gives you the right to enter these gates? Puzzled, the first man says, my own? I did more good works than evil deeds. I'm sure you can find a list there somewhere. Peter says, wrong answer. Go to the end of the line, I'll give you one more chance. And now everyone in line is going, don't say I did more good works than evil deeds. That's not the right answer. Next person comes. Who's Righteousness gives you the right to enter, Peter asks. My own. I ask for forgiveness for every sin that I ever committed, even the ones that I can't remember committing. Wrong answer. Next. Now the women are digging in their purses, looking for pencils, so they can start making notes. And the men, of course, never carry a pen, but they're looking in. Whose right, or whose righteousness gives you the right to enter these gates? My own? I may not be perfect, but I'm better than my neighbor. Wrong answer. Now, half the crowd's given up hope of ever getting in. The crowd looks like Dodger fans in the eighth inning of a losing effort. <laughs> We're out of here, man. Until one child steps forward and answers, God's righteousness. And Peter says, you may enter. We are not going to enter heaven based upon a list of our good works outweighing our evil deeds. We are not going to enter heaven based on whether we've asked for forgiveness for every sin we've committed. We are going to enter heaven based on the fact that God declares us righteous and gives us His righteousness. And His righteousness is enough for us to enter heaven and enter a relationship with Him. So that, that's the point that I wanted to make from that section. Some other points to consider from this passage, and I'm going to be, try to be real careful and read it. Um, is that Paul writes that this righteousness from God comes through Jesus Christ to all who believe, and then he repeats that we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, historically, we 
at this point in our text have prepared for a, a, an argument, whether imaginary or, or a real argument, about exactly how much faith in Jesus or what kind of faith in Jesus is Paul talking about, or we might argue about what does he mean by all who are going to be saved, does that mean all who believe in Jesus or all who believe in Jesus the way that I do? And we spend our time discussing those things. My message today is not to settle those arguments. Uh, I don't think I could, so I'm not even going to try. My only caution is this. We should never presume to know exactly by what measure of faith in Jesus that God is going to require to get into heaven. For all I know, if there is such a list of strongest faith to weakest faith, I might be at the bottom of the right list, or perhaps even at the top of the wrong list, because I wouldn't know where my faith would be compared to what God requires. But I do know this, that if I was on the wrong list, I would be praying that when he said, when Paul said, to all who believe in Jesus, he meant even the weakest faith in Jesus. And that when he said all who believe in Jesus, that he really meant all, including me. So that's my caution. What I want to look at now are the verses that we often don't talk about because we're busy looking at those others. In verse 25 and verse 26, Paul writes these words that point out some characteristics of God that I think we often overlook. In verse 25, Paul writes, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Why did God present Jesus a sacrifice of atonement? To save us? To redeem mankind? To pay a price for our sins? Those are all good answers, but it's not Paul's answer. Paul's answer is to demonstrate his own justice. That's kind of a funny thing to say. But that's what Paul says. That God sent Jesus as an atonement, to, for, of, a sacrifice of atonement to demonstrate his justice. And here's the reason why. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Forbearance means that you don't claim a legal right that you have. Or it could mean that you acted with patience and you put off acting on that legal right that you have. And in this verse, Paul says that God acted in forbearance and put off condemning the unjust. It reminds me of chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul describes God as having riches of kindness. Now, when I think of that, having read The Hobbit several times, and now that the movie's out, I think of the pile of gold that the dragon sits on, if you've ever read the book The Hobbit, that would fill rooms a hundred times as big as this. That's riches of gold. And Paul is describing God as someone who has riches of kindness and tolerance and patience. And that the point of God's patience is to bring us to repentance. That's a picture of God that I think we need to keep in mind when we go over this section. But I think we also need to ask, to whom is God demonstrating his justice? If the reason God sent Jesus, who is he demonstrating his justice to? Who is his accuser? Who would dare claim that God is unjust? The same being 
who accused God of buying Job's, Job's love and worship. Satan said to God, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? I can see Satan saying, There you go again, forgiving people who don't deserve it. How can you call yourself a just God when you refuse to punish the guilty? I can see Satan saying that. And again, this is what verse 25 says. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Who is this God that would put up with a lesser being? accusing him of being unjust. God knew that the price would be paid when Jesus came. He just didn't tell Satan that. So Satan didn't know. There may be a lesson for us here. Perhaps we should consider this interchange between Satan and God when we may not have all the facts in front of us and we say things like, well, if he was a loving God, then he wouldn't blank. And you can fill in the, the one that you've heard. I've heard many of those. I, I think maybe the lesson for us is, don't be like Satan. You don't know all the facts. You don't know everything. Don't make statements against God, accusing God, unless you want to end up like Satan and, and making statements that you have nothing uh, no, no credibility behind. So, uh, I think that is an important point for us to remember that God forgave the unjust in the Old Testament and that he put up with Satan accusing him of being an unjust God until the point came where Jesus paid the price. And that sometimes conflicts with our view of the God of the Old Testament. But let's go on from here and look at, again, verses 27, 4 through 8. And I think I'll just summarize it. In these verses, Paul uses Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and David, the great king, through whom the Messiah would come, to prove that God has always credited people with his righteousness through faith. He even says in verse 5, However, to the man who does not work, but trust God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So here's the part that's going to be on the quiz. Who is this God that Paul presents in this passage? Well, first of all, he is a God who freely gives his righteousness who all, to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he is a God who patiently withheld his right to punish the wicked, even while being accused of being an unjust, unjust God. Thirdly, he is a God with riches of kindness, tolerance, and patience. And fourthly, he is a God who gave us the law, not to punish us when we failed to keep it, but gave it to us to lead us to the point where we are willing to accept his grace. This picture of God's character is far different from the picture of the God of the Old Testament that many of us grew up with. The God who couldn't wait to punish those who broke the law. This scripture is in stark contrast to that. God's wrath will come to those who refuse his free gift of grace, but he is a God with riches of kindness, tolerance, and patience, leading us towards repentance. So as I conclude, what difference does this make? Well, in my opinion, 
it makes these three things. First of all, you need to trust that God's righteousness has been given to you based on your faith in Jesus. Stop worrying if you're good enough. Let God's righteousness be enough in your life. Celebrate the gift that you have received and be thankful. Secondly, when we or you break God's commands, understand that you worship a God who justifies the wicked. He desires to show you mercy. Remember the words of David, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Remember when talking to people, thirdly, remember when talking to people who don't have faith in Jesus, that God is patiently waiting for the, to give them his gift of righteousness. Pray that you might be honored by being the one who brings the news of God's gift to someone who needs it. If you are someone who is in need of God's gift of grace, if you're someone who has come to the conclusion that you'll never earn righteousness on your own, then this is the time that our body has put together, or put forward for you to come and, and uh, confess Jesus and be baptized in his name. So will you please come as we sing.